So this idea is that this is the wild, wild west. Um, and, and for many of you who are going to be uh, interacting in the healthcare space, uh, this becomes a professional um, uh, problem because you will go to people who might be on ethics committees who think they know things, like a Muslim doctor, but they don't know anything. Or they don't know enough. Let's not say they don't know anything. Or you might go to an academic who has critiqued you know, the field and says, don't believe anything that jurists say because they don't understand what they're talking about. And so it makes it a professional quandary of how do I navigate uh, the field so that I can help my patient who's suffering from a spiritual crisis who wants some guidance about how to think about this and what they should do when I can't find a singular body of knowledge and everything but he's out there, right, and saying everything. So that's why I start this course off by, by dissuading you of the notion there is such a thing as a singular expert in Islamic ethics. And now we're going to talk a little bit about, after we go through the readings, what is Islamic at all, right? Um, uh, we have a, you have an Islamic chaplaincy program, you have an Islamic sort of educational master's, you have a, right? But, the, but a friend of mine just three days ago, uh, he said to me, he's at a major foundation, and he's you know, in charge of like, I don't know, five to seven million dollars worth of funding. And he said, you know, if the one thing I can do after I leave this organization is if I can stop people from using the idea of the Islamic X, Y, Z. Right. Um, I said, why? He's like, well, because I get all these proposals. People say, I want to do the Islamic, I don't know, whatever. Or, and there's no such thing. Islam sees itself as universal. So you might be doing some research or some project on generating this an Islamic perspective on X, Y, Z. But all these people keep on saying, I'm going to develop the Islamic, whatever. And, and I can't do that, right? There's no such thing. It's a historical, like, where would I come from? Um, even so, so I think that's that's a challenge for this field and many other fields because we all, not we all, but many of us, uh, you know, uh, think of it as a unitary. Uh, uh, it's not that it's not a unitary tradition, but there are many many different lines within that tradition, and so you can have an Islamic view that comes from a specific lineage, but you can have another Islamic view from another lineage, and they might be totally opposing. Um, so to say, I'm going to come up with the it's just not a, it's just not possible. Okay, so so inshallah, that was the, the introduction. As I said, today I went longer since it was my lecture, but um, in a few weeks we're not going to go as long with the videos. So I'd like to do now is kind of go through the reading, and then we're going to, uh, for the first part of, yes. So our session today was about the, what is the Islamic nature of Islamic ethics. So the first question today, right, was who are the producers and consumers of Islamic ethics literature? Um, we talked about that, so just, just so you have this, since you don't have the slides, I say that there are several different, um, several different disciplines. You know, we, everybody thinks about the Islamic scholars, so I call them jurists um, because I'm thinking about the muftis or the qadis, which also you have some reading and dis discussion about who they are. Right? So, so then you have physicians, so MDs, DOs. You have social scientists. Right, who I would say, so this is anthro, right, um, policy people. You have Islamic studies, and by this I mean PhD people, right? Um, you have, so that's one, two, three, four, and then you have, uh, then I, I, the other category I go through are sort of law, right? So law, uh, not lawyers, but you know, law professors or comparative law people. And then if you really want all of this, I don't, I don't, in my chapter I talk about this group because one of the reviewers wanted me to put this group in there, although I didn't feel it belonged. He said bioethicists from the Muslim world, right? And so you'll see I added a category, I don't know which version you have, but I do because the reviewer wanted that. And he said, well, you know, because we have these, um, programs in the Muslim world that are Islamic bioethics. Yet, when you think about bioethics here, you know, bioethicists can be JDs, PhDs, they can be MDs, they can be masters. I mean, you can have a lot of different disciplines within that group. So I don't know why this helps us because you don't know what discipline expertise are coming from. So, but in any case, I go through these six sort of uh, producers, classes of producers or disciplinaries, disciplines within the production of Islamic bioethics that all have a different notion of what they want out of Islamic bioethics, but what is also the Islamic. Uh, when we get to my 
turn out the board, I'll, I'll give you that at the end. But now it's time to hear from you all. So inshallah, we had several readings uh, for this notion of introduction to Islamic bioethics literature. There's, there's Bakr's, Hamid's, Bonazidas, Shabana's, Kasuli, and, and mine. We're not going to go through mine since I just, you just got the lecture. But um, I'm going to actually time people because we want to get, get to some reading, um, get to some conversation. So we'll start off today talking about, starting off with, sorry, Shabana's. So I had SH and RM. So, so there's three things he's doing in this paper, right? Um, and they're all important. I, I'm starting our class with this piece because you will, as you have read already, he, he's talking about law, uh, right? a little bit about Islamic law comes into the, th so he talks about the categories and then he even brings in this notion of you need to have rational bases and so we use maqasid now a lot, which you will have, you had another reading on. He talks about the sawwuf, uh, he talks about adab, he talks about adab al-tabib, right? So there are different genres of ethical thinking uh, within the Islamic tradition. And he sort of says that cumulatively, all of these have to come in together, to, uh, have to come together to think about Islamic bioethics. He almost says that, I'm saying that. Um, but he says that you have to use the full spectrum of ethical thinking within the tradition when you want to generate Islamic bioethical norms. So he brings at least these three strands together um, and saying that there, are, there is ethical content within each one of these. That's, so I think that's a supplemental argument he's sort of making, not just showing that there's a historical linkage, uh, there's historical links between thinking about these things within our tradition. It's not like everything is new, right? And we have to use the foundational sources as, uh, as an arbiter for what is Islamic. So good. All right. So that's, that's his piece. I, um, the, the next piece that we have today that I would like to start with this, um, is, hold on one second, let's just mark it. I think, um, Osman Bakr's. So, so when we label something Islamic, mm -hmm. right, how, where is it coming from? So, so, so Shabana, as you expect from a legal scholar, mm -hmm. he says, Quran and Sunnah, mm -hmm. starting point, then whatever Quran and Sunnah sort of say, Islamic, right? That's how it goes. That the origin of Islam, mm -hmm. which is not an uh, uh, incorrect position, right? Mm -hmm. That what is Islam? Islam is revelation, mm -hmm. right? right? So what, that's what the Islamic motion is. Everything is, is revelation. Islam came into being when there was revelation, mm -hmm. right? And so you have whatever the revelation then speaks to as being Islamic. And you can say, well, I'm going to expand the scope of revelation by understanding the values the revelation gives us and labeling something else that wasn't part of the tradition initially as Islamic, fine. But the source, right, is coming from that, 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 uh, that well. Of, of, Quran. of Quran and Sunnah, starting off, the tradition starts at this point. Okay. Right now, yes, we're going to say sort of theologically and doctrinally that this comes from Adam, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. But seriously speaking, the Qur'an and Sunnah then become the, as she was saying, filter, I think, or whatever. Like, so the, the, but it's not just filter. He's saying, Shabana, the origin. Mm -hmm. Right? So, Bakr is saying something different. And we have to understand that, because we're going to problematize the notion of Islamic. So, so his idea, you, as you said, his idea is Tawheed. Mm -hmm. Right? And that, what is that notion of Tawheed? How does it play a role in Islamic? He talks about epistemology, and as, and as an epistemological register, he's saying Tawheed. So you, who, those who read Sayyid Hussein Nasir, right, and perennial philosophers, they will know that this is the line that he's sort of taking. He's not a perennialist, but, but he's taking this line of Tawheed, okay? Um, and then he does do, as you said, he does the requisite, because you can't talk about Islamic anything without saying Sharia, ah, which, which is code for Quran and Sunnah, right? You can't do that. If you do that, then you're sort of almost out of the fold of Islam if you don't do that, right? Um, so he does this, and he said at the level of action, we have to think about what the Sharia is telling us, right? You're thinking about the level of action. But at the epistemological register, how you know what you know, how you know what you know, he uses this idea of Tawheed. And what he's doing, different from Amen, is he's saying, and that's why he starts off with a body, and he uses this term called the microcosm, the macrocosm, right? And he's so, sort of... Um, he, what he's doing is, is he's weighing in on this, this, this old debate 
about reason versus revelation. Okay? And so what he's saying is that both of these, right, both of these indicate towards God, right? Because everything is, right, God is the truth, is al haq He's the only real. So both of these indicate towards the indicates towards God. So epistemologically, they're on the same register. Reason and revelation. Yes. So now there's many ways to get to think about how you would weigh them. But he says, okay, this is Quran and Sunnah, right? Mm -hmm. This is what? Science. Yes. All right. Social science, mm -hmm. natural science. Yes. And so you might say that the filter, the filter, right? So the Quran and Sunnah will sort of say, okay, what of this we can take? But at the epistemological register, this also indicates towards God yes. because they both have to be ayats, right? Yes, yes. And therefore, we don't have to originate here everything. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right? We don't have to originate everything here. Mm -hmm. We can say it confirms. We can use it as a, as a, as a sieve, right? Um, as a sieve, not a filter, right? So, or a filter, right? So whatever is coming from here has to at least be concordant some of the Quran and Sunnah. And then we say, but we don't have, when we label something Islamic, it doesn't have to just be here. All right? So that's what he's trying to, now, obviously he's, he's writing as a philosopher so when, uh, and doing many things. I think the important thing for us when we're thinking about what is the Islamic, he's now moved beyond the scope of just Quran and Sunnah and saying, okay, so Islamic can come from science, mm -hmm. right? Or what he will say, natural philosophy, right? So, 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 so there's a huge debate um, within Islamic sort of thought about natural law, as you will see when you have Anwar Ayman's reading that I gave you. So you, um, I'm, I'm, this is a survey class. You're going to go through all these lines of thinking but you'll, I'm trying to give you connections. So he's going to say natural philosophy, tawheed, right? And then you'll see now a whole scholar talking about reason, because where is reason coming from? Yes. Right? Natural law theories need to think about the epistemic sort of value of reason and thinking about moral truths. Mm -hmm. I think one so he's, so I'll give you this up front, sorry, so that you can sort of see, so you can sort of, when you get the other readings, you'll sort of play, so why, where is he saying that? Why is he saying this? Go ahead. I, I was just wrestling broader category reason then fall, falls under the idea of the branches of science which just opens, and opens up a whole other perspective about it. Yeah, I mean, so reason, reason also occurs in the Quran Sunnah. You can't access Quran Sunnah without sort of applying rational sort of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, yes, but the idea of just reason by itself, reasoning about, or let's use it, reasoning about not the Quran Sunnah, reasoning about nature, mm -hmm. that there are ends to things, that there are values embedded within nature, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason why, uh, why there isn't, uh, that the, uh, the, the, so, uh, the animal kingdom works the way it does, right? Um, that there is some basis for that, and that also indicates towards God being the origin of those sorts of instincts. So he's opening that space. In medicine, this is the reason why the body works a certain way. So you'll see later on, Ghazali, not here, so you don't have this reading, but Imam Ghazali, reading Ibn Sina, right, he then sort of says, okay, well look, uh, I understand that there is wisdom between, uh, there is wisdom in the way the body functions, there must be wisdom in the way the law functions. Mm -hmm. So his theory of, 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 of sort of ta'alil, of deriving wisdoms uh, from the Qur'anic legislation, is part, he talks about this, well I looked at the body and looked so intricately, right, so how can it be the production of scholars doesn't have this sort of same synthesis, right? We must have rulings that come for benefit, the body works in a certain way, so his theories of maslaha and trying to sort of synthesize these disparate sort of rulings from juridical jurists is based on, well there has to be some sort of, right, so when he talks about al-Qasid, He's actually thinking about it. He talks about it. this is how I came to it because I looked at Ibn Sina and the amazing body and how the body functions and everything has a proper place. That must be the case if they come from the same source. Now he's not going to say, he's not going to say that reason and revelation are the same epistemic register. Ghazali won't say that. But but Osman Bakr sort of makes that move. 
because of the lineage of his, his thinking where it comes from. Okay. Question. Yes. Sorry. Can you qualify that idea a little bit more? I mean, reason and revelation yeah. um, Abu Bakr from um, Abu Bakr's position is he saying that reason, i.e. natural law, or reason, what's reason exactly? It's, 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 uh, well, well, that's going to come in, in our session about, about reason. But, but Osman Bakr is, is, is his, his the, the point for this reading is that he's, he's thinking about the, the indication towards God in scientific truth, so natural, in the nature. The nature has reasoned ends. Those reasons are knowable to us. And those reasons give us... T natural theology, right? So the idea, that, so they give us a sense of... So this is uh, it's natural law, right? So, so the idea that things have ends that are purposeful and our brain can encompass those purposes just like we can do the same thing why Allah SWT says don't you know don't kill that the same faculty of reason can be applied to those things but there are ends to the things you see around us that's that's simply his his, his position um, yeah okay. so then moving uh, the next one I think that's important to talk about is Bonazitas. So she's writing in some response to Osman Bakr. So I think that there's, there's, there's a few things I'll point out. And one of them, if you have the paper, so I want you to, so the Islamic for her, she actually says very clearly. Um, and um, so on page 118, right? And we're talking about Islamic ethics, right? So, so I'll read it to you guys. Don't look at it, but she sort of says, um, our judgments of ethical or unethical on Islamic grounds need to be based on the Quran and Sunnah, right? So she just says, ethics, Islamic morality, right? Ethical values are not subsist self-subsistent subsistent, and they, as, they are not, as they are never dissolved from actions, right? So when you think about, now this is a, very important, when you think about actions, actions, the science that gives you the Islamic for actions is Islamic law, right? It's judging the act. Is it mubah? Is it haram? What is it? So the Islamic science associated with actions, act-based ethics, right, in the Western sort of paradigm, is Islamic law. You can't do without it. That's what judges actions for the, right, where they are, for most of actions. So then, but then, so she talks about this, and she says the ethical value has to be evidenced in the text, right, in Nas, Quran, and Sunnah, and contextualized by action. But then, and she says several things, she says, okay, it does not seem far-fetched to state that some basic ethical values being rooted in fitrah, should be recognizable upon comparison of different ethical contexts or cultural contexts. So an Islamic model of bioethics is therefore determined by a set of Islamic legal rules, right? right? And their application to relate to, self, to, to life sciences. Um, so, so that statement that she says here, being rooted in fitrah, means that there is Islamic law plus. Plus. Right? That there is something, and now, um, so it's hard for me because if I was going to, you know, I just, I, 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 this course is the one where I just gonna start lecturing on all these topics. But, but this is an important sort of ledge she puts you on. There's Islamic law, action is fine. But there's fitrah, right, some natural disposition happening. I'm using the term proposably. Natural disposition that's happening. And so this can tell you something about ethics. Your inner constitution, your natural disposition, your fitrawi sense, gives you some sense of what is ethical, right? So, so in distinction again, from Quran and Sunnah origin, right? She's saying there's something else happening here from your own being and your own constitution. Now, she says, and she talks about this, and we're going to do it in the next session, right? About she talks about the mutazila. And he talks about the you know, other views. But there's a real important, I think, um, statement she makes about what this has as far as implications for how you think about ethics. Right? So she says on page, uh, where is it? Let me find it. She makes some statement about, right. OK. So she says on page 116, from Islamic view, this whole idea about science having any, any sort of value system or not leads to this question. If you think about, you know, just Islamic law, um, when there's a ruling, 
right? There's no when there's no evidence, sorry, in the Quran or Sunnah, right? Then what is the ruling of a matter? Al asal fil ashia ibaha, right? So this idea of permissibility or tahrim of an action comes from the notion of whether or not you need the Quran and Sunnah to legislate actions all the time. Like, does the Qur'an and Sunnah have to speak about something, right? So scholars, Hanafis are on the opposite end, by the way, for something. Shafis love this notion of Baha, Hanafis do not, okay? Um, but is the base ruling of something permitted or not? Or do you have to derive your understanding of whether this is right? Do you have to actually use the Qur'an and Sunnah to apply a value system? So she says, so, so when she's, what she's trying to do in this article is leave a space, right? She, like everybody else, as I said to you in my lecture, you can't say Islamic law doesn't exist when you talk about Islamic, uh, Islamic ethics. So that is the most important science. Then she goes on to say, but there's something else happening here that you should think about, right? That there is some sense you can get from, she uses the term fizzle law, that there's an inner disposition that there is now the origin, right? So you know the hadith, that every child is born on fitrah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some important aspects of this that play into role in Matui, the Ashari, and Mutazai thought about what you can judge upon based on no nas. So she foreshadows that by making a statement that, look, there is some idea of how we have to play with law, but something else to think about how things that aren't spoken about by the Qur'an Sunnah specifically are going to be judged, right? So the Islamic law plus here is that there's some, right? So some might say that we don't have Ibn Hazm, there's no judgment. What the Qur'an and Sunnah says explicitly, univocally, everything else, ibah, nothing. There's nothing to say. The Qur'an Sunnah has something to say about that. Right? There's, some will say, no, you have to apply methodologies in the Qur'an and Sunnah to indicate values for everything that exists, right? Mm -hmm. Some will say, use your, it's actually working in the way it should be working, right? And not hawa. Working in the way it should be working, mm -hmm. right? And not hawa. Mm -hmm. Right? This is still open, this is not a closed discussion uh, by any means, but she's adding this notion to make it, she's, she's saying things to try to help you think about, or at least try to indicate that there is some conversation that needs to be happening about things that are not univocally addressed by the Quran and So for her, there is a role for fitrah in thinking about moral truths, moral norms. How far it goes, she doesn't tell you in this article. How far it goes in the sense of what that actual truth? Yes. Okay. Right, so she's, she's delineating for you what those parameters are. But, but the idea of there being a, so she is using this notion of being just fact, mm -hmm. is important. So, so this is um, another sort of, uh, so anyways, so this, 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 okay. So now, facts versus value. So she sets this up, I think, beautifully by using, I think Ibn Khazbun's or whatever idea. Right? Mm -hmm. And she's sort of saying, there's ilm, right? And this is value. This value comes from your heritage, right? Mm -hmm. From your ideology, from whatever, right? So we can say, fact, um, that heart beats at six weeks for a fetus. Your value will be, this is a human being, mm -hmm. this is a nothing. You will, you will attribute that value to that fact, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right? Science tells you that the heart's beating at six weeks. You will attribute your value based on your ideology of whatever you think or what that means. And um, this happens all the time. But in her view, she's very concerned about the fact that we don't, we see that we, we fuse this. Sometimes mm -hmm. when we live, this is fused together, right? And we can't separate it. But for those, and she's critical of the Islamization project of Islam, uh, uh, Faruqi, but she says for those who are trying to sort of do this, they're just a sort of an impossible task. Because we're so informed by this fusion today in generating scientific truths that we can scarcely recognize where the value is and where the fact is. Mm -hmm. And for Muslim physicians, this is a big problem. 
and for Muslim chaplains, this is a big problem. Right? You'll see. But this is a big problem. Because if you're not critical of where you're attributing values, you will think that these are Islamic facts, or these are medical facts, or you'll sort of think what they're not. So, so I just give you an abortion example, another example, right? What should chaplaincy be? <coughs> Non-directional, huh? non-denominational, interfaith, right? This is our profession. Now that profession, is it a fact or value? Value. It's a value system. Mm -hmm. There's no fact there, right? That's not how it could be. It is, right? It is because of, I mean, sorry, let me rephrase what I'm saying. That is not the only way that it could be, right? But we separate that there's a value judgment in the professionalization of our, of our, of our profession, whatever you want to say, the civilization of our profession. Physicians, same thing, right? Is health the ultimate good? For a physician, yeah, maybe. But is that the way it could be? Not the only way it could be. Health is not the ultimate good. We fast every Ramadan with a hit to our health, right? There could be a different way of thinking about that. But for us professions, is what I'm saying, it becomes a problem because we sometimes forget that there is this, big, this fusion of fact and value in our professions as well as to not even see that there's a different way things could be. And, and that, so when you, now you want to separate the, you know, the, the, what's the I hate, I hate, I don't hate them, but like I have a big problem with metaphors because I have too many layers in my head. Wheat from the shaft, or whatever they say, I don't want to, right? Like you have a problem. Because you can't see that there are two things that are fused together. What would be an example of, the, in the, of agreement? There's no agreement. I mean, you have to separate them. They have to be separated. If you're going to make a judgment about a moral, uh, ethical claim, okay. you have to separate them. Okay. So in, the, in, the, in, the, in our ethics, we all ask, right? so if you say, okay, well, look, you know, what are the scientists saying about this? Social, natural, whatever, medical. They say something based on their methodology of, right, of your writings. Like I said, six weeks of heartbeats, okay. Um, another fact would be, it is a very good one, right, that, um, that I cannot bring this person back to consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's my fact when that's I'm telling you fact. that someone's died. Mm -hmm. Brain death. Mm -hmm. That's my fact. Mm -hmm. But I say brain death, and you say what? That's right. Physical. He's dead. The only fact there is I, as a physician, can say the person is dead by law. Mm -hmm. Right? And the, that's one fact, because I've given that, given that authority by our state. Right? And the other fact is that I can't bring that person back to their heart beating again, right? Or to their brain working again. That was the fact. Mm -hmm. But when I say brain death, or you say brain death, that's attributed to values. I don't, can't tell you what death is. I have no idea what death is. I have no idea. That's not a fact. Right? It's not a fact. Now, in Islamic view, what death is, we'll talk about. But you see, like there's, we don't. Our language, our vocabulary, has become so connected mm -hmm. with this fusion that we forget that we can't separate them. And when we make ethical judgments, we do it all. I say malpractice all mm -hmm. the time. Right? All the time. As as professions, as scientists, um, and sometimes we confound the scholars because we speak in these terms.